Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Lee. I'm the president of the Singapore Heritage Society, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's Cha Time. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Cha Time and about this, uh, the uh, Sicha. Sicha is the Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage Alliance, and it exists to try and promote effective government community partnerships in cultural heritage management in Southeast Asia. And this is so as to strengthen the ASEAN social cultural community as a people-centered third pillar of ASEAN. And we are uh, here to serve as a networking forum between ASEAN member organizations, and we hope to be a dialogue partner with ASEAN governments and the ASEAN Secretariat. So uh, Chat Time is our series of uh, talks. We've been doing this for some time now, and we uh, often introduce talks about um, various important aspects of cultural heritage in ASEAN. And uh, we are in the middle of our theme, which is cooling earth with cultural wisdom. Um, and we still have a number of different talks uh, on this theme. But uh, without further ado, let me introduce you to today's moderator. Um, he is Dr. Pirapat Wisuk. He is an officer at the Siam Heritage Trust uh, at the Siam Society under royal patronage. And he has an academic background in the languages of ancient Western Asia. And he's also interested in many other topics like archeology, span manuscript studies, heritage management in politically fragile environments. Um, and so he will be introducing today's speaker. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Jack. Um, good morning. Good morning, everyone from the monsoon within Bangkok. It's 10 a.m. here, and I think it's around 10 p.m. In, in the location of our speakers, and that is where she is uh, zooming in to us this morning, this morning in this part of the world. Um, I'm very delighted to be introducing you to Celia or uh, Le Bui Anter. Um, she'll be sharing with us her uh, part of her research that draws relations between um, the climate crisis and the endangered um, indigenous languages. Um, just before we start, um, a bit of an introduction to uh, our admins and everything. Um, this chat time talk will be available on YouTube on a later date. And if you want to, to watch, um, do subscribe or like our page um, for more updates. Um, the talks will be around um, half an hour to 40 minutes. You're, you're welcome to leave your questions in the Q&A box. Um, what else? And there will be a bit of a survey at the very end for our future um, program. So stay tuned to that. Um, so yes, Celia is a social justice advocate and an artist based in New York City. Uh, she, came from, she came from Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and currently works for the Climate for Innovation in Mental Health at the City University of New York Graduate School for Public Health and Health Policy. Um, Celia obtained her BA in Linguistics and East Asian Studies from Columbia University and is, is passionate about Indigenous languages, queer liberation, grassroots organization, and health justice. And she works uh, on these issues on local and, and national levels in collaboration with US civil rights and community organizations. Um, so without further ado, the floor is yours, Celia. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Dr. Pierre, but should I share my screen? Okay, so thank you everyone for waking up extra early for the Seisha. I know it's usually 2 p.m. on Saturday. It's 10 a.m. now, I think, in Bangkok and mainland Southeast Asia. So thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Um, it is 11 p.m. at my time, so I do apologize if I sound like I'm about to fade. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, the title of my session is called Indigenous Languages Conservancy in Climate Action. And as Dr. Peter Pat has wonderfully introduced, um, my name is Celia Le or Le Buento in Vietnamese. And I currently work for the CUNY School of Public Health and Health Policy 
in mental health research um, in New York City and also globally. And I hold a BA from Columbia in Linguistic and East Asian Studies. And a little bit about my linguistic background. So I've done field work with Wikitongs and the Endangered Language Languages Alliance, um, which are both works based in New York City. And they're about endangered languages and the, preservation, the preservation of it. And I've done language justice projects um, based in New York, Boston, the California Bay Area, um, as well as Northern Vietnam, et cetera. And I approach language with a social justice focus. So here are some example of the work that I've done in the past with the Southeast Asian Diaspora Project. And you can see here, this is Hmong, Khmer, Lao, and Vietnamese here. So my specialization is language justice amongst populations who are double minoritized. So people who are minoritized in their native country and then um, are become minorities again in their adopted countries. So for example, Hmong, Korean people, Hmong Chinyard people, or Mian people who escaped the wartime conflicts in Southeast Asia and migrated to places like the United States. So I explore um, the relationship between um, people, uh, those populations and the relationship they have with their languages. Oops, I just realized I forgot to click press present. I'm so sorry. But yeah, um, so let's just get right into it. So we're in a language extinction crisis. Um, every 40 days, a language dies, and half of all spoken languages are estimated to be extinct by the end of the century. So that's about um, 7,000 to 9,000 of them. Um, most of them are only verbally spoken. And this crisis is being actively worsened by the climate crisis. And the most impacted continents are Oceania and Asia. As you can see here, Oceania has around 733 endangered languages, while Asia has around 693. And both of these re regions are critical to us as Southeast Asian because we're right in the middle of it. And so Southeast Asia is a very linguistically diverse region. The five major language families that characterize the regions are Austronesian, so languages like Malay, um, Indonesian, or Tagalog, or other languages of the Philippines, uh, Kadai, like Thai or Lao, Austroasiatic, like um, Khmer or Vietnamese, Sino-Tibetan, like Burmese, and Hmong Mian, obviously like um, Hmong and Mian, um, both of whom are ethnic minorities in countries like Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand. And their Southeast Asia are is also home to several language isolates. isolates so languages are not have yet to be proven to be related to a language family. And there is great diversity and plurality in the region. So there are countries, as you know, like Malaysia or Singapore with large minority populations. And many of these countries have their own indigenized English varieties as well. So like Malaysian English or Singaporean English. So indigenous languages are vulnerable. They have been vulnerable because of the history of persecution of indigenous peoples worldwide. And right now they're becoming more vulnerable than ever. A fun fact about uh, linguistic diversity is that it is not distributed evenly it tends to concentrate around biodiverse areas, so around the equator. And Southeast Asia just happens to be one of them. For example, right here, um, very close to Southeast Asia, is Papua New Guinea. It has 0.5% of the land area of the world and has 10% of the world's languages. And other countries in the region, like the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia also has an incredible amount of languages. And these biodiverse areas, these coastal island areas are home to communi communities vulnerable of climate change. So they're really sensitive and vulnerable to sea level rises or natural disasters like tsunamis. And a single natural disaster event could wipe out a language. So for example, if a community who lives in a village nearby the sea speak um, an, a critically endangered language and there's only about 50 speakers, a tsunami could wipe out an entire village or create a refugee crisis 
um, in which people would struggle to maintain their mother tongue. So I would like to share this quote by the former president of the UN General Assembly, Chaba Kuroshi. I can't see it because um, Zoom is acting up, but I think it's with each indigenous language that goes extinct, so too goes the thought, the culture, tradition, and knowledge it bears. And so because linguistic diversity tend to be concentrated around biodiverse areas, indigenous peoples, aka people who speak these vulnerable languages are also safe keepers of these biodiverse areas. And these vulnerable languages hold incredible knowledge, localized knowledge, such as weather patterns, local crops, stewardship processes like burns and clearings, local flora and fauna, worldviews, sustainable food system, disaster preparedness, and especially worldviews that transcend distinction and boundaries of Western science. And ensuring that these vulnerable endangered languages continue to exist is ensuring the well-being of environmental stewards and our collective Mother Earth. I would like to briefly point to a case study of the RM people and language. They are as officially categorized by the Vietnamese state, um, a subcategory of the Duke ethnicity in Guangwen province in Vietnam, that is in central Vietnam. And they officially assimilated in 1956. They were, as the story goes, they were discovered by some Vietnamese soldiers. And previously, they have lived in cave, cave system in Phong Nha, Nha Ke Bang National Park, such as this picture right here. This is a picture of Sun Dong Cave. It is currently the largest known cave passage in the world by volume. It is so large that it has its own ecosystem. And so there's a lot of things that we have yet to know about it. And 22 more caves were actually discovered in this area, in the Phong Nha Ke Bang National Park in 2023. So you can imagine the amount of knowledge that, for example, the RM language or the Dik language would hold. And it is a critically endangered language with less than 100 speakers. So here I have my slide, it's titled Do Badao Arem, which means I am Arem in the Arem language. Arem meaning rock curtain. Some Arem people have resided in caves and they have close religious relationship with local forests and environments, and they are the stewards of the local forest in central Vietnam. Some of the challenges that they have faced and are continuing to face is that their customs have been portrayed as backwards, so that religious relationship, that relationship that enabled them to be really sustainable and protective of the local environment are not recognized as something good in the name of law, order, and development by the Vietnamese state, but rather as a backward custom. And there is a severe lack of cultural programming, and there are anti-indigenous policies that are facing, why are they anti-indigenous? Because there are existing policies that are aimed at improving the economy instead of people's well-being. And there is a lack of official status and recognition. So as I have mentioned before, they are categorized as a subcategory of an existing ethnicity. That's because getting recognition as an ethnic minority is very difficult and it's a complicated process. And there are several ethnicities that are not recognized as ethnic minorities in Vietnam, because um, the state government thinks that they're Vietic in nature, therefore they're not, they're Vietnamese people and not ethnic minorities. And so this sort of politics surrounding who is an ethnic minority and who's not, what is an endangered language and what is not, um, gets in the way of how much resources and time we can dedicate to preserving these languages and protecting people who are currently speaking it. And the picture that I have on the left is the Nehru's house in the Ren village. The Nehru is a local um, Ren person. And I just want to reiterate that having the right to speak your own mother tongue is a human right. And I have some quotes here from indigenous peoples around the world to sort of speak for ourselves. So from Ken Wyatt, who is Aboriginal Australian, 
he said, for indigenous peoples, it lets us communicate our philosophies and our rights as they are within us and have been for our people. And Tarsila Rivera-Zea, a Quichua woman from Peru, poses the question, what does Mother Earth look like? Each one of us perceives it in a different way. And so we must ensure the rights of indigenous peoples with language justice. So we have to make sure that whatever we communicate, we communicate it in the language that people could understand that people deserve to get information then. And I would like to give you an example that is the lack of language justice, which is the um, Dalek protest by the other people in Daklak province, Vietnam. So on my right, on the right side of the screen here, you, you can see the potholes and flooding in Ku Quyen district in Daklak province in Vietnam. This is in the central highlands in Vietnam. And so the local officials proposed that the rainwater um, is redirected to um, that lake to avoid flooding. But locals are concerned, were concerned that uh, wastewater would be redirected to this water source as well. And what is already a tense relationship between Central Highlands ethnic minority and the Vietnamese government? Because um, during the Vietnam US War, the um, Ede people and other ethnic minorities in the Central Highlands uh, region were on the US side in exchange for their sovereignty. And so they already have a very tense relationship post the Vietnam US War. And this lack of indigenous participation and this lack of acknowledgement of like the mistrust from local ethnic minority people from the government has um, caused massive protests and protests shut down in the Central Highlands. So this is an example of what not to do of the lack of um, of the lack of language justice in the process of uh, trying to mitigate climate change in Vietnam. So this is what not to do and what we can learn from it. So <clears throat> given all that, what does effective language and cultural revival look like? There have been many cases, not as many as there could be, but there are some cases around the world that we could learn from and they share some similarities in which there is official status given and there is language and cultural immersion because people will not learn a language if there's no prestige. People will not learn a language if it's uncool to speak a language. This is why minoritized languages are struggling to survive. If a dominant language is cooler to be spoken, then the younger generation will not want to learn to speak the minoritized language. They will only want to learn to speak the dominant language. So this is why a lot of languages struggle to survive, like indigenous languages, that are dominated by another dominant language or languages in the diaspora. And what these successes also have in common is that they are efforts backed by law and national governments. And they include indigenous leadership. So given, giving indigenous or ethnic minority people leadership roles and protection from knowledge exploitation. So not researchers coming to get knowledge from indigenous people and then leaving. And some examples around the world that have been successful are the cases for Hawaiian, Maori, Quechua, etc. These languages, which were severely endangered just a few decades ago, are now thriving with cultural immersion programs and um, speakers from the young generation. So after all of that, here is my list of recommendations um, that we should have multicultural policies and programs we're beginning to see countries in Southeast Asia, uh, especially Vietnam, embrace their images as multicultural nations. So that is good. That is an acknowledgement that there are ethnic different ethnicities in Vietnam. There are different languages being spoken and there are things that we must do to preserve this multicultural heritage. Um, most importantly, giving people official status and recognition, having a willingness to cooperate with indigenous leadership, such as by acknowledging concerns regarding newer developments, granting official status to et ethnic minorities, giving them land rights, promotion and preservation of endangered languages, 
there is a big initiative to combat the lack of literacy illiteracy in ethnic minorities by requiring schools to teach Vietnamese language, but that what is missing is preserving the vulnerable languages and ensuring that children are speaking it inside the home in addition to being able to read Vietnamese. So there needs to be programs that acknowledge um, our very diverse languages that are in our nations and what we can do to ensure that it's being passed on to, ne to the next generation. There also must be an effort to protect ethnic minorities' livelihood as tourism increases. So this beautiful cave behind me, Dong Cave, there was actually a proposal to build a cable car through it. Luckily, that's not happening. But as you can see that as tourism increases, both domestically and internationally, there's a lot of new developments being proposed. So people must take into account, officials must take into account what it would do to ethnic minority livelihood. And finally, we must be willing to support initiatives, initiatives being led by ethnic minorities. And one of them is better communication strategy in regards to climate change. So this picture here is actually a radio station in Gaobang province and they're speaking in Hmong. And radio is a very popular mode of communication for ethnic minorities, not ju just in Vietnam, but worldwide because most languages are not written down. So this is very effective. It's effective when the terrains are challenging. It's effective when you can't be there in person. Radio is easy to hear. It's incredibly easy if your language doesn't have an alphabet, for example. So if we support initiatives like that and better our existing communication strategy, we can continue to improve our language justice initiatives. And this picture here is the Bru Van Gil people, also in central Vietnam, in the fourth central Vietnam ethnic festival in Guang province. Yeah, so my conclusion is that preserving vulnerable endangered languages is incredibly important because they hold important localized knowledge as we have discovered because biodiversity equals linguistics diversity. And Preserving vulnerable languages is important because it means that we ensure the well-being of people who have been taking care of these biodiverse environments for millennia. And there have been many successful examples for Southeast Asia to learn from. And they all share in common the official recognition of identity, having language justice to ensure people know their rights and that people can advocate for their own rights. And most importantly, a willingness from the government and local communities to work together in these issues such as language justice and climate mitigation. And on this picture is a Bana teacher in Central Highlands, Vietnam, instructing the students in Salai province. And here are my references. So want to check them out. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Celia, for this for very insightful illustrations of how I think we're able to say that that I mean in in tackling the climate crisis we we need cultural sensitivity and we need to look into the the cultural aspects of how how this 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 situation which is to me at the at this point more often treated from the very scientific you know um, aspects but but at the end of the day we're dealing with an aspect of, of of the crisis has a lot to do with actual human being and how they would survive how we would survive as as human beings so so um this is an important part of the discussion that we need to talk about um right on to on to questions and discussions um should I start with with a, a quite a broad question? So, representing an international organization here, what do you think is is the role of an international an international organization in 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 perhaps um, encouraging local government to to implement policies that are um, 
policies that are friendlier to 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 the survival and the well-being of, of ethnic minority or you know because what 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 we've seen through uh, your examples is is a situation that is well a situation that's actually not related to climate crisis right but it's a very political situation that somehow has an effect in 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 climate action yes Yeah, I'll answer a question, but I also think Dr. Jack is raising his hand. But yeah, I think that international organizations can serve as observers to hold state officials to committing to do the best for their um, their people, and especially ethnic minorities, because as we can know, governments are not neutral. They can do good things. They can do bad things. Um, sometimes the bad things go unnoticed, so it's important to have some foreign parties uh observing and ensuring the rights of people and i think that there is sort of a cultural and information exchange that's also really useful that international organizations can bring in because the indigenous advocacy and the indigenous languages preservation movement around the world especially in central and south america in north america to an extent in the pacific and in Oceania and Australia have absolutely been bright, vibrant. And I think that in um, Southeast Asia or in East Asia and in, and in Southeast Asia, there's this notion that we we were never colonized by a different race. So everyone sort of all came from one place, right? This is all for land. So why are there indigenous people? What are they? Why does it matter? Aren't we all indigenous? I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from um, watching other countries' movements and learning what it's like being indigenous, what it's like being not from a dominant culture and learning from our peers around the world. So yeah, I think having an international organization being sort of a role model and also being an observer can be incredibly helpful. Hi, could I ask a question? Yes, yes, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I, actually, I, I was curious um, to find out from you whether you could give a few examples on how helping to preserve um, an indigenous language might actually help in relation to the climate emergency. Thank you. Yeah, so I think there's two parts of it. There's like the part where the language itself holds knowledge. So really incredible knowledge from isolated but biodiverse regions of the world that we have not yet to know a lot about scientifically. So that language can hold a lot of knowledge. And it's just really helpful if we can know, like, for example, there's a lot of like new medicine being discovered with the RM people in this cave system. And there's a lot of new plants being like discovered and being studied right now. So that's one thing that it might help um, with climate mitigation. The other thing is that we live in, like, I know for me, I live in the city. So I'm really isolated from like, taking care of the environment, for example. So people who speak um, vulnerable languages have been taking care of these diverse environments for a very long time and know what's the right way to do it. Um, and so ensuring that people are like having a good time, ensuring people's well-being by ensuring that they're not essentially oppressed and being able to freely speak their, um, their mother tongue is um, like a way to keep them well enough to take care of our languages and just benefit us collectively. So yeah, two parts, knowledge and well-being of peoples. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Just, just to add to Celia's answers just now, if I may, when we had discussions about this earlier back in January, I think I think one of the important part of of, of um, giving space or 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 preserving indigenous languages is the fact that apart aside from the knowledge, the raw knowledge part, there is also this idea of 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 uh, world views and, and 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 perspectives about things. Right? I mean, now we're living, if I may say, with a lot of people living in in what what might be termed the, like a post-scientific kind of environment um, with with a specific kind of worldview, right? And, and this is now the worldview that's being being 
dominant in in in, in um, climate action. Like what else? What what else is there? What what if we we looked at how how um, people um, people in 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 different parts of the world or or people who are ethnic minorities look at their world? How how do we how could we adapt their their way of thinking into solving this 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 crisis? Especially if these are people who are living with the nature and and as to has this have this knowledge of how to to read to be part of the nature. Um, there's one question coming from our audience member, one, one member of our audience, asking how might we enlist the assistance of members of successful groups, such as the Maori, the Hawaiian, the Welsh and the Christian, it, to assist these indigenous groups in Southeast Asia? Yeah, I think because Maori and Hawaiians are also in the Pacific region, there's um, academically, there's quite a close relationship between um, academics of these regions in Hawaii. I know like the University of Hawaii does a lot of endangered languages program, but um, members of indigenous communities, right, like Hawaiians and like, let's say, indigenous people in Southeast Asia are actually not that aware of each other. So I would honestly love to see in my lifetime some sort of cultural exchange program or just to be able to bring that Hawaiian model of language and cultural immersion revitalization to Vietnam and say, hey, this is how you do language protection correctly. This You have to immerse people in the culture. It's not just a, a dictionaries and opening classes and teaching people, but it's also about empowering people to love their culture, to be proud of their culture, to be able to want to speak these languages and continue to teach them to the next generation. So I would love to see some sort of culture exchange program like that being done to folks in Southeast Asia, just from the Hawaiian and the Maori models of cultural empowerment that they have. This answer is also, is also I think this answer applies to our other question, but but I think it, it's a bit more specific, so I'm just going to read the question out again. Um, so in relation to, to what you just answered, how could we promote the learning of endangered languages among the young generation, especially if, um, and I think this is the interesting part, if there are very little people left um, who could speak that language? Yeah, so I think that if a uh, language is critically endangered, like the case of Arendt, the first step is to write everything down, to document everything, because there have been cases where language revitalization has happened in the past, where there has been no speakers left, but there is an extens extensive archive. Left. An example of that is Hebrew. So to write everything down, make dictionaries, um, consult um, indigenous elders. And then what I would do is, again, give um, this endangered language an official status, promote it, um, just kind of like giving public announcement on why it's endangered and what we must do to save it, and also empowering people um, in that ethnic group to be able to overcome that barrier that's set by the dominant language and being empowered enough to feel that they want to speak their um, endangered language, that they're not embarrassed to speak it. Um, in society, right? Because I know that in my case, I can speak for myself. It was like embarrassing to like to having to speak a language where people don't understand you. People look at you weird. So yeah, just getting people to that stage where they feel pride in their own cultural heritage and wanting to teach that language and that heritage to the next generation. Um, the next question uh, is partly related to our first question. In your experience, how does UNESCO heritage recognition help the indigenous communities? And do you believe it can play a significant role? And the second question is from the same, uh, same from the same persons. Um, is there an endangered languages uh, recording program in Vietnam? <clears throat> yes, thank you for that question. I think UNESCO heritage recognition is kind of like the, the wish plate. I mean, it's, it can help, but it's also 
can't you know, like um, does harm to it. So what it helps is that it draws the attention to the community, um, and there are more the if you get more attention, it's better because it means that you're able to potentially get more resources, get more funding, get people attention on like how your language is endangered and how people can help your community and help your languages to be revitalized again. So it can help to spike our attention of people, but it also still can harm because um, it can draw more tourism to the area. And as we have learned, Tourism is um, not necessarily the best thing ever to happen in Vietnam right now. There's a lot of um, natural sites being damaged by newer developments just because the insane post-pandemic increase in tourism. So yeah, got to be careful with that attention. It can help, but it also can do, can do harm. But I would say that ultimately, ultimately, it's good because it gives the, commu the, the community some sort of recognition, something that they can like pride themselves on. And the second question is, is there an endangered languages recording program in Vietnam? Um, I would say that there's not a coordinate program, like there's no official Vietnamese government endangered languages recording program is all isolated. Um, I believe it's mostly either Vietnamese or foreign academics doing their own projects with their own languages or group of languages or language family. And there are also nonprofit organizations like the one that I worked for that are doing these sort of isolated and not at all coordinated language recordings in Vietnam. So whoever you come across that's speaking like a sort of vulnerable language, you just record them. And it's not in its most ideal state right now because it could be better, could be coordinated better so we could better understand the relationship between these languages um, that are vulnerable. Like some of them are mutually intelligible and some are not. But if we are able to, let's say, have a, like a state government-wide program like this, it would be incredible, of course, if it doesn't like exploit knowledge. Um, the next question is is related to very closely related to to what you just answered. So, what if the idea is that what if what if the um, people of the people who speak indigenous languages start sharing knowledge about about um, um, sharing their world views about about the climate and how how they how they could, could be part of nature and everything. Um, what are the concerns? Are there concerns that we should be aware of um, about how language revitalization and all this sharing could lend to the continued exploitation of indigenous communities? So yeah, this is system on, on the flip side. Like when you start sharing knowledge, as 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 people who are already under threat or 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 the um classified as as minority, um, how do how could we ensure that that for example, if the RM people start sharing medic medicinal knowledge, is it it's possible that these resources could be exploited and disrupted their way of life? Um, what's what's the what's your opinion about this? Yeah, it's it's absolutely exploitable. In fact, it's already happening. Like whenever, like for example, when tourism comes to Sundam, there is a village called RM Village, and people who trek to Sundong Cave will stop by these villages and sort of just they just go, "Oh my God, look at these people! Look at all these ethnic minorities, and they're just kind of living their life." It's kind of like also like in the case in Hawaii when you're like you're living your life. In under this lens as viewed by an outsider and they're sort of like exoticizing you in a way and it like earns you livelihood but at what cost but yeah the exploitation is already happening um they're, they're this the Vietnamese of government officials that are sort of saying oh look the RM people are poor so we're giving them some crops so they could do um, some farming on it. But the reality is that the crops that are being farmed there is not the local native crops. It's more of what is more prof profitable and what is not. So it, it comes down to what is development and what is like 
poor and what is not poor and what the state officials could do to improve the <clears throat> the province economy. So the exploitation has already started to begin under the guise of like tourism, like tourism, tourists that trek to escape, who stop by at their village and just sort of like gaze at them. And the knowledge is being kind of like exploited under the guise of a national unity. Like, oh, Vietnam is multicultural. We have many ethnic minorities, but we're all living happily together. That sort of stuff. So yeah, it's absolutely they're absolutely being exploited like other like a lot of other minorities in Southeast Asia. And this is why it's so important to have indigenous leadership and to give indigenous people leadership positions and to support ideas that are come up that that um came up by local people by ethnic minorities people and not just supporting initiatives that are proposed by a central government so it's it's 15 to 11 a.m here um let's just say we'll, we'll do one more questions and then we'll do more discussions later <laughs> somewhere um the final question, how the language, uh, how could the language of the uh, indigenous people can influence the um, attitude and mindset of the people, the government and business to save and protect the environment, especially the impact of climate change? Yeah, I think that's um, a really good question and also one that's hard to answer because you can never actually predict how worldviews and the act of protecting uh, a population that speak this vulnerable language can influence the attitude and the mindset of people because I think I think that's really hard to predict. But I think just by featuring and putting a spotlight on people that are actively protecting the environment, that are actively holding these valuable knowledge by putting the spotlight on um, a more climate-friendly, sustainable lifestyle. I think it's still a good thing to do, even if we're not sure what good effects it might do to the central government. Yeah, I think it's still a good thing to try to do. Right. Um, so just before we end this discussion, I think um, that is clear from, from CD's presentation and our discussions that uh, I think what is important in what is important in, in hacking climate ethics is aside from the sciences of everything, there's this cultural part, um, cultural sensitivity, um, giving the right people um, the right um, position in society, um, leadership, indigenous people leadership, very important. Um, oh, wait, um, I think this is important as well. Celia, how could we follow your work and if we want to, you know, to share more thoughts and comments to you, do you have a platform or, um, you know, a channel that we could, you know, remain in touch with everything? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I guess I can put my email down somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> I'll just say it now. My email is celia.le at columbia.edu. Um, I think I should send a message to House and Palace. Is that right? I'm not sure if that's the just, right Just type, type your email into the chat box, please. Perfect. <laughs> Um, so for the next episode of Chart Time, um, this is going to be a very special uh, episode. It will take place on October the 7th, so next month, uh, from three, a uh, half past three, half, a uh, half past three to half uh, to five p.m. I will be uh, on site live. 
from the Queen Circuit National Convention Center in Bangkok. This is big. So it's a, it's a session in collaboration um, between CSHA and uh, the Sustainability Expo 2023 hosted by CRCN, which is a cultural organization based here in Bangkok. Um, the, the session is titled SX, and that is uh, Sustainability Expo 2023, and chart time with CICHA on ethnic communities in safeguarding cultural and natu uh, natural heritage. Uh, we're going to be welcoming uh, three speakers uh, from three different ethnic groups, uh, very special, for a panel discussion, again, on the 7th of October, that is a Saturday, uh, 3 p.m., uh, half past half past 3 p.m. to half, uh, to 5 p.m. Uh, if you are in Bangkok or if you happen to be if you happen to be visiting Bangkok during that time, you're welcome to join us at Queen's Queen Circuit National Convention Center, uh, G floor plenary hall. Or if you're watching live, uh, stay tuned to our Facebook page for the live event. Um, just before we end, uh, Cisha is developing uh, is in the process of developing new program uh, for or for this for the for the discussion for the webinar and everything else. Um, we are going to distribute a questionnaire link in the chat box. So if you have time, feel free to share your opinion about what we could do or what we could adjust to make this a better. Um, experience for uh and that's a better experience in space for sharing cultural knowledge uh for climate uh, for the climate action um thank you for tuning in uh and we'll, like, should i be the person who ends this uh webinar or dr jack would you like to give me closing <laughs> remarks I'll just go ahead. <laughs> anyway thank you everyone as well yeah this has been a very interesting session and i think i learned something that i didn't know before Right. Thank you, and we'll meet again. Take care. Okay. Thank you, Celia. Good night. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs>